Sportages. Sport gets smarter. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Sportages videocast. Today, I have a really interesting uh, guest with me. He has been climbing since he could walk. He started his climbing journey in the French Alps and reached many summits over the years. In 2014, he was part of the group that nurtured the idea of state organizations within climbing and then created Sport Climbing Victoria. He joined the board of Sport Climbing Australia in 2013. While he's first the director of the company, he's been acting as a CEO. Today, everyone, we have on the show Romain Tevenot. Welcome to the show. Thank you, uh, Zushin. Thank you very much. Um, welcome, everyone. It's great to have you here, Romain. And, you know, I'm really excited to chat to you about Sport Climbing Australia and your own journey. But I wanted to start off with a little bit more to do with your personal story. Uh, having been, and perhaps the growth of the sport. Having been involved in climbing for, you know, essentially since you could walk, so most of your life, how have you seen the sport grow both competitively but also as a passion amongst people since that time? Look, uh, that's uh, uh, really interesting the way the sport of climbing has been moving uh, over the last uh, 30, 30, 40 years. Um, it's a relatively new sport. We sometimes make some confusion in, in, the, in between the sport in, of indoor climbing and outdoor climbing. And they are managed and run in really different ways. And in some ways, actually, the outdoor part of the sport is not really managed in itself. It is more a lifestyle activity. And the sport of indoor climbing has developed over the last, uh, mostly over the last 30 to 50 years uh, as an actual activity. It was originally brought as a way for climbers to train because climbers wanted to climb mountains and they wanted to reach summits and climb harder on harder routes. And uh, the indoor part of the sport uh, therefore developed itself as a tool for, for climbers to be able, able to train. And slowly over the years, uh, the technicality that was uh, um, growing within the, these facilities on these centers, and then the technical skill of the climbers is what developed uh, the indoor sport or the indoor, the, the, um, um, the artificial sport, let's say, in some ways, no, rather than indoor. Uh, this is what developed uh, this sport as an activity in its own right. And it's only, a competition has actu have actu actually existed for more than 50 years, but it's only really in the last 20 years that they've developed uh, a lot faster. And now since uh, 2016, the sport has been uh, um, accepted as being an Olympic sport for the upcoming, we hope, Tokyo, uh, Tokyo Olympic Games. So this, this has been a whole, you know, really fast evolution for the sport and for the activities themselves. And uh, the disciplines that, that we know these days, uh, the most original discipline, which was the rope climbing that we call uh, more commonly lit climbing, uh, was uh, the original discipline and that has been um, a thing for many years in competition, but also in venues uh, for uh, participants to just practice it. While the two new disciplines on the newest being the speed, but also the bouldering activity are, are much more recent disciplines that have uh, developed as disciplines in their own right uh, for um, the communal aspect of the sport, but also for the competition aspect of the sport. So there, there's been a lot of, a lot of changes. It's a sport that's going fast. This is, uh, we, we're about to see more and more coming. There's actually for the Olympic Games, a discipline that's a mix of disciplines that is completely new again. So this is actually really interesting to see all this um, evolution of the sport uh, from pretty much from one year to another, actually. And the way it has evolved in, in the people that approach the sport, I think, is that uh, there, there used to be, as I mentioned, uh, the use of uh, artificial climbing or, on indoor facilities for climbers uh, to, to climb outdoor. Therefore, it was more outdoor climber that will make use of the indoor facilities. While the way with the sport evolving these days is that it's the first step to connect with the sport is more the indoor world. 
And uh, that, that's a major difference. And then some of the people that get exposed to the sport uh, via uh, the uh, artificial climbing activities, I mean, please don't get confused with artificial climbing. I'm going to say it's indoor because it can quickly become confusing otherwise. So let's call the indoor sport anything that's on plastic, as we call it. Uh, this is the way people get exposed to the sport these days, and then some of them uh, may get to want to have an outdoor adventure on, on discover the outdoor sport. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's just incredible how we've seen uh, the sport grow, how we've seen gyms come around, as you mentioned, and obviously we've got the uh, Olympics coming up where climbing is that new sport. And it's And it's interesting that you bring up that point, you yourself being originally from France, France is the French climbing team is actually one of the countries, I guess, that is most likely to make podium in one of uh, in the men's or the women's, whichever it may be. But it's definitely one of the strongest countries when it comes to climbing. Why do you think this is what if you know, you go back into, I guess, the roots and the origin of climbing within France, we've generally seen a lot of stronger athletes come through. Can you tell me a little bit about the reasons why and why you think this is? Look, I think it connects fairly to what I was mentioning on, on the connection in between the outdoor and the indoor. Um, in the sense that um, the mountain range uh, that, that is available in France via the Alps, uh, but also via, via the south of France on the Pyrenees and, and um, a, a whole lot of smaller mountain range as well, has given access to the concept of climbing on, on to climbing historically much uh, for, for a much longer period than in Australia. And uh, this, this is where there's a really big difference in, in the way the sport had evolved over the years on where it started. Uh, for example, Chamonix, which is one of the mountain cities in France, has been known for one of the capitals, if not the capital of alpinism uh, for many years on where alpinism, alpinism grew on evolved uh, since its essence, really. So this is really historically um, fairly different, uh, the situation that we have in Europe, on, on Europe, on more specifically in France, on the way climbing has evolved, on climbing uh, people have been exposed uh, to this activity. And uh, I think this is how um, the outdoor part of the sport I brought uh, a much earlier development of the indoor world and of the facilities uh, that, that we have these days in, in a country like France. And this has also given access earlier to, to youth, uh, the, the youngest, uh, with via school programming, for example, that we start to see more and more in Australia, but that have been a thing in, in France for more than 20 years. And, and kids from the, you know, the earlier stage of five, six years old can have, have been ha having access to to climbing uh, for, for many years, while well, here this is only something new. So this, I think it's quite historical. There is a bit of delay in the way climbing has developed. Uh, the boom of, of facilities as well that, that we have seen in, in Europe on, in a country like France for the last 20 years now is something that we started to see in, um, in Australia for the last five or six years. So, you know, things, things are going to change fast. And um, and we're going to see that I think Australia is going to start to catch up uh, relatively fast to, to the rest of the world, you know. Um, and uh, we, we're already on, on the way. And I can tell you we, we have a couple of assets coming that will do some really great impressions. Um, I'm quite certain of that. So, yeah, that's, that's mainly where, where the key differences are on, on where the sport has evolved differently in, in France. And I mean, with this and with that stronger in story on, on bigger exposure, uh, you know, uh, the evolution of uh, any kind of organization of sport comes with, uh, with the numbers. Um, you know, we, we are still a small community here and we are still a small organization. And um, the, the numbers will grow, as I mentioned it, and, and since it has been so big in France for so many years, uh, the, the size of their national sporting organization, for example, on uh, their historical um, development, on uh, the way that organization has um, presented and uh, on, on evolved the sport is, is you know, far, far different from what we've seen here on, on much, it started much earlier than it, had, that it has here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's really interesting how, you know, how the difference is 
between the two nations. But of course, like, you know, you've already touched a little bit on the future uh, within, within climbing in Australia. And I guess that brings me or ties in really well with my next question, which, which I was sort of thinking had to do a little bit with, you know, obviously sport climbing Australia, but from its history, you've been involved since its inception, you were there prior to it as well. And you've been a part of sort of you really uh, institutionalizing this community here in Australia. So tell me a little bit about how all of that came to be. Yeah, so Sport Climbing Australia has actually existed since uh, 2008, I believe. And please, I may, I may say something wrong. But in, in, in the mid, uh, in 2005, 2008, somewhere around there. So um, it, it's an organization that uh, developed as uh, the organization that would um, govern the sport of climbing and in particular competition climbing and um, the way uh, we manage the national team on mostly at a, as a high performance um, control organization. And uh, back when, uh, when I started to get involved, so in 2011, 2012, Sport Climbing Australia was uh, a much smaller organization. We didn't have a uh, state organization as we have these days in Australia. And uh, so it was a group of, of people uh, that were led uh, by uh, Carly and Rob LeBreton, uh, that are really famous figure of climbing in Australia and uh, were involved at all level of the management of the organization back then, and as well as a couple of um, other people that have accompanied them in that journey as well as developing the, of developing the organization. And when I joined uh, the, this uh, story, uh, we were uh, in Victoria with a couple of uh, people involved in planning facilities in Victoria, and there was very few facilities actually back then. We only had four or five facilities in Victoria, which is not even a, a third of what it, what it is these days. On, not even thinking about what's happening in wow. the coming years. <laughs> and uh, it was, yeah, b back in 2012, 13, uh, where uh, Phil Goebel, uh, Will Hammersla, James Cafe, and as well as myself, we, we got involved in, in starting to co talk about how we could uh, start to create more connection in between the facilities and generate a bit of momentum around competition as well and try to build uh, that uh, more regular uh, competitive aspect on, on high performance development of the sport for Victoria. And this is where the concept of uh, state organization kind of started, where we, we started to think about creating a, an, an association within Victoria that would uh, take care of the management of the sport within Victoria. And as we did this, this was something that was actually already happening partly in New South Wales, where uh, the um, historical SEA was based and also in Queensland. So all these things were happening at similar moments. And as we started to quit Sport Climbing Victoria, the um, people at Sport Climbing Australia started to be really interested about what we are doing as well. And this is where we got involved with uh, Sport Climbing Australia. And then uh, this is where myself as well with my um, interest and involvement in developing Sport Climbing Victoria as a state organization, I became involved with Sport Climbing Australia in trying to uh, encourage on, on, in trying to accompany uh, the, the organization in creating more state organizations. So this was about in 2013, 14. And since then in uh, 2018 is, is when we had our, our seventh uh, state uh, organization credit. So we only have uh, one state yet uh, that doesn't have one, which is the Northern Territory. But this is to show that in only four years, we went from having a small um, organization uh, that was based in, in New South Wales on uh, man managing the sport on the national team to a multiple organization concept, organizational concept, with one state organization in, in seven out of the eight state and territories, as well as now a national board uh, so sport on the national organization, Sport Learning Australia, uh, that acts as the national body to represent the sport and to coordinate uh, the activity of all the states. That's absolutely incredible to just think that in such a short period of time, the sport has grown so significantly. And, you know, I think we did talk a little bit about that earlier on where, uh, you know, you were saying Victoria had five gyms or indoor facilities. Um, we in Canberra have four 
at least four, I think, yeah, four, three or four facilities. And considering the differences in population, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's shocking. But it's absolutely great to see at the same time as well how much the sport has obviously grown. And, you know, on, on the one hand, there's obviously been all this success and, you know, you've been able to achieve so much. But, of course, with any sporting organization, particularly in its relatively speaking infancy, there is a lot of work uh, to be done. And, you know, there is still, I think, you know, when I, when I started climbing a few years ago, people would ask also, what is that? You know, what, what do you mean you climb? Like, are you, I don't know, are you, what are you doing? Right. Um, whereas now, and, and, you know, while I say that free solo had a bit big influence on it uh, in helping people understand what the sport is, it's also the fact that it's grown so much uh, that people are aware. However, in your, in your opinion, I guess, being involved on the administrative side of things, tell me a little bit about some of these challenges in really growing uh, climbing within Australia. And then I guess the second part to it being, what do you think needs to be done to perhaps overcome these challenges? Yeah, look, we have some great challenges which any climber loves, any climber loves challenges. That's all we do. We pick a challenge and we try to surpass it <laughs> uh, on, at an individual level, but also, you know, as a group, uh, on, on, as a community. We have many challenges. This is true, on, especially since the, we've joined the Olympic Games, which is really unique for the situation in, here in Australia as a national sporting, sporting organization. We were talking before about Europe and France where the national sporting organization are, you know, multi-million dollar company on, 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 they have, you know, tens on tens of employees on historical functioning that, that is not the case with sport in Australia. And, uh, we, we became an Olympic sport. So we are just part of one of, I mean, a new one of these very few Olympic sports and we have the same, um, the same goal on the same objective than them. And it boosts us at a, at a, stage that is completely different from the one we used to have and this has evolved we were saying it so fast this is you know it's only since 2016 only if, if you remember the couple of dates i were mentioning that 2016 is when we had only a few state organizations here um only a few people involved in the sport so this come with these come challenges this is true uh, the some of the biggest we have i think in australia are the access to uh facilities on, on particularly government funding facilities, um, focusing mostly uh, on the high performance level of the sport at this stage on competition climbing. It can become quite difficult uh, as a state or national organization to be able to train the athletes to the level we want to train them or to be able to run the competitions uh, to the similar level that what we can see on the international scene because we don't have many facilities that are at an international standard first, uh, but also because most of these facilities are pri private businesses. And while we do have some great relationship with them, at some point, the, the balance is between uh, their, their goals as a business and their need to run as a business and our needs for us to be able to access these facilities to develop our sports um, can only go so far. So this is something that we've been working a lot with most of our state boards on engaging with local governments and local councils in order to be able to potentially have uh, a government funded facilities or, or partnership pri private uh, slash uh, public partnership to be able to develop such facility which will allow to bring uh, the terrain on on the standard that we need for our athletes but also to release the pressure that, that we put on, on our, our friends from the businesses that are currently running. Um, and this is, you know, this, this is really difficult to be able to, to manage, um, this reliance on, on, on the private businesses on, on to constantly, you know, be, be putting the pressure in some ways on them, uh, because we need them, right? On, um, on they are supportive and they do want the sport to grow as well. But the need for us to have access to, uh, a publicly funded facility for the purpose of uh, high performance on training, but also competition uh, is something that's certainly one of our biggest challenge at the moment. Uh, that's the number one, I guess. 
and on this with this will come more things um i think as the sport grows there is the need for the sport to standardize itself and there's actually a lot of work that is being done at the national level at the moment and also to grow our workforce on on we we've seen the sport developing really fast in the last five years i don't even count anymore <laughs> i used to be able to to tell you how many more gym we had in the last couple of months for year but i just can't anymore so things that have been changing on you, you can imagine that if you double, triple the number of facilities on the number of people that access the sport, and on, on certainly actually the number of people that access the sport, it's probably 10 times what it was five or six years ago in terms of just getting access to the sport on a regular basis. So if you grow all this so fast, you cannot build as fast a workforce that is skilled on experience to be able to support the industry. And while there's, there's been some great work done on the number of uh, of skills on, on job within the spawning industry have increased, has increased drastically. The actual, um, experience on skill set of the workforce is not, on cannot grow as fast as, as the, the speed at which the industry is going, right? So this is going to be one of the challenge too. And, uh, these are discussions that, that we're having at multiple level at the moment on how, um, you know, we can look at, uh, accompany the workforce as well to be able to develop it and I'm thinking in particular about the boot setters and the coaches that are two uh, really specific skills for our sport uh, so that's that's going to be a second second big challenge alongside with that naturally we need more money but this is you know I don't think this is really productive to just say that uh, you know it's uh, we, we need to find ways that we will grow um, I'm going back to sport landing Australia will grow our organization and we'll try to grow it, you know, as fast as we can. And I think we've been doing pretty good, at least over the last five or six years, um, in the way it's evolved drastically from, uh, you know, on the number of people that, that, that are involved. So, um, yeah, this, this is, I mean, these are the, the key, the key challenges that we're facing these days on, uh, but I'm quite confident that, you know, we, we will do what we have to do to accompany it. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I love how you started off the whole uh, response to that by saying climbers love a good challenge. And I think that uh, summarizes everything that you said really, really well. And, uh, you know, just based on how uh, I personally have seen the sport grow from when, you know, and I only, like I said, started climbing a few handful of years ago. It's, it's phenomenal to see. And I think, uh, you know, you guys are doing a great, great job and it's only going to go up from here. And we at Sportages also uh, look forward to, you know, being a part of that, that journey with you guys, even to the small extent that we are, but nonetheless being able to share some of those stories and uh, obviously help, help promote the sport is uh, part of what we intend to do as well. And, you know, you also touched on, on the, the Olympics and, uh, what that can, uh, I guess, potentially, what that potentially means, but at the same time, the challenges that come with that. But I guess moving a little bit to the uh, positive side of it, of the Olympics, uh, generally, generally with sports around the world, Olympics means funding, coverage, uh, sponsors, potential more uh, potential media involvement and so on I know I've sort of touched on those things very briefly but maybe you could elaborate a little bit on that yeah. or perhaps tell me how that ties in with you know the sport climbing Australia mission and climbing in general yeah sure and what's interesting is we we would want to think that the Olympics have have, have generated all that interest in climbing in, to some extent and you know we were talking about how fast the facilities have been growing down here, but also everywhere around the world, really. So in some ways, we want to think that the Olympics are kind of a driver of this. But at the same time, if we are in the Olympics, it's also because the sport is growing, right? I think these, these two things really go hand in hand. On the popularity of our sport, uh, as, as a lifestyle sport, as they call it, but also as, as a, an activity that um, provides the great physical and, and mental challenge that it provides, um, is, is what has made, made it more, more and more popular, right? And 
the Olympics will just be a platform that will allow us to showcase our sports event server. And there's many positive outcomes out of this. I mean, you know, one of the positive outcomes is all the, uh, the great work that we've been able to do on how fast we've been able to, to develop our organization on how fast we'll be able, able to, um, to develop our sport in, in Australia on the access to the sport. And uh, the Olympics will give us a platform that will allow us to be seen more and more. And we've only started to see that. We haven't even been yet in the Olympics. So a few, uh, on a, you know, you were saying a lot of people don't, uh, don't really understand what climbing is about. Like I think more and more people do understand what climbing is about. More and more people see that it's not necessarily about climbing with no ropes and being a crazy person on top of a mountain. Uh, there is also, it's also a sport as any other sport that, that can be done on a week to week basis. And this is something that's more and more seen. And, uh, you can imagine that as the Olympics will come, hopefully next year, if not in four years, <laughs> but uh, this is, you know, uh, but this, this, it will come. We do know it will come. And as we will get our first athletes, hopefully Australians, and I think we are actually uh, extremely confident that we will get some uh, Australian climber in Vionatics. So uh, as this happens, the possibility for our sport to be seen even further and understood even further we we can't even imagine how far it will go alongside with that we've come things like sponsors uh exposure via the media and uh, partnership and um, on ways to grow sport climbing australia as the support su support organization or national sporting organization that that governs on 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 coordinate the sports uh we will even become bigger right uh, so these i mean the olympic games are going to be a big uh draw card in that and, but as I was mentioning, it's not really only the Olympic Games that are doing it. It's really a hand-in-hand -hand process on, on the fact that our sport is becoming so big is why we are in the Olympic Games. On the fact that um, our sport is offering and will offer, I, I believe, the, the, show, the showcase and will offer the, the show at the Olympic Games for the public and for the non-climber on the way it will, it will be seen on, on, on presented to um, to people is what will will allow our sport to to go even further. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think uh, exactly how you you said it. it. It's it's a showcase. You know, Australian uh, athletes get a lot of coverage when the Olympics come on. Now, hopefully, there will be a climber too, uh, which means you know the country the country knows it. I'm 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 still pretty confident that you would come across people particularly in, in rural parts of the country. Like you said, the Northern Territory doesn't have an organization uh, who don't know what the sport is yet, but when it's on, on ABC as a part of the Olympics, you know, that, that uh, may, may change everything. Uh, you know, Romain, I feel like we can keep on talking and uh, chatting about a whole lot of things. And, you know, I have so many other questions which we can perhaps uh, discuss some, at some point in a part two to this. But I did want to sort of end end our discussion today uh, with a with a bit of an opportunity for you to share uh, what what sport climbing Australia may potentially have coming up in in the future. Of course, all things considered, it's always a maybe at the moment. Um, but you know, anything that you may like to share or be interested in telling our viewers and or listeners about. Yeah, look, I mean. Uh... As you mentioned, it's a uh, strange times to be able to do big announcements. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, there's what, what's coming soon is our Oceania Championships. The, the Oceania Championships, I, I can't right now say the date because we, we, we are uh, aiming to have December at this stage, but there's potential for postponement. So uh, this, this is quite difficult to, to give actual dates at the moment. But the Oceania Championships is when uh, is the selection event to be on Olympic Games. So this is where we will know uh, who uh, will represent Australia or New Zealand at the Olympic Games. Uh, one male and one female will, will qualify via this event. It is due to be held in Sydney uh, at uh, Sydney Indoor Climbing Gym Villawood. So please keep an eye on this and we really hope we can 
give you a date straight answer on the exact date of that event. And that will be the biggest event that, uh, I mean, the biggest, not in numbers, but in terms of uh, importance, that will be the, the most important event that we've ever had uh, for climbing in Australia. It's an international federation of sport climbing event. Uh, so it is uh, due uh, to, to come really soon, and it will be also shared all around the world. So I think the, uh, that will be the first uh, new way for us to showcase our sport and the exposure we'll get via this event on, on the opportunities for any of, of, of the viewers uh, to be able to understand our sport and see what will come and see who our, who our athletes are and what they can do on the amazing uh, show that they can put on the wall. Uh, that, that's certainly the, the next thing to look for. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, to everyone tuning in, uh, be sure to go check out uh, Sport Climbing Australia's social media channels, which will be uh, below wherever you're watching or listening to this uh, from. So make sure you go and do that and keep up to date. And Romain, I will add that Villa Wood was actually the place I climbed for the first time. So, uh, you know, when it does happen, we'll definitely be there and we're really eager to, you know, uh, see this happen. And it's And it's a big thing for the climbing community and climbing in general here in Australia. Romain, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show today. And, you know, really looking forward to the growth of climbing in the country and obviously what you guys keep doing and essentially keep doing what you're doing because it's great work for the sport. Yeah, thank you very much, Zushan. A pleasure to, to be with you too. Um, I can't wait to, to have uh, our athletes being able to share with you and share with the world on I'm sure what our, our sport is in the coming months and in the coming years. Absolutely. We're looking forward to it. So everybody do stay tuned for some awesome, awesome content coming out very shortly by Sport Aegis. And of course, in, in partnership with Sport Climbing Australia. Thanks again, Romain, and you have a good one. All right. Bye. Thanks.